everyone, and welcome to Heritage Mississauga's Saturday Matinee. My name is Justine Lin. I'm the Resource Center Assistant here at Heritage Mississauga, and I'd encourage everyone to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Now, today we have a very special program. We are going to be talking a bit about Christmas traditions from around the world. And this is very much a cultural celebration, celebrating all the different cultures um, of many of the residents here in Mississauga. And uh, first, I just wanted to start by, you know, talking about some of the original, um, you know, origins around Christmas, right? So a lot of these things come, they predate Christianity, they predate so many things in, in the modern world, and they find their roots oftentimes in the, a lot of these pagan traditions um, around the winter solstice. Why winter solstice, you might ask? Well, because it's the shortest day of the year. So there's this thought that actually, you know, the worst is over and um, and the future can only be brighter from here. It's only going to get better. So it's a renewal of hope for the new year. Um, and a very good example of this would be Yule, which is a winter solstice celebration often celebrated by the Germanic people, um, and is very much celebrating the nature um, and also the Norse god Odin. Um, and a lot of these pagan celebrations end up being incorporated into Christmas um, uh, with the arrival of Christianity. Um, now, one thing I kind of was wondering myself was, well, why December 25th? Um, of course, we know it, it more or less coincides with the winter solstice, but it's a very specific date, correct? So a lot of this actually has to do with, for example, um, an ancient Roman solar festival known as Natalis Invicti, which is celebrated on December 5th. Um, and it's a celebration of the sun god or Sol Invictus. Um, and Chrysostom, um, who was a fourth century early Christian, wrote that they say that it is the birthday of the sun. Well, he is the son of justice. So you can see that there is this link between these older um, uh, uh, traditions and with the, the coming of Christianity, which is quite interesting. Um, another thing is, who is Santa Claus? Um, you know, this has been a very much commercialized aspect of um of Christmas, but he very much has um, very historic traditions, um, you know, coming from St. Nicholas, who was a Christian bishop born in modern day Turkey around 280 AD. Um, and he was the Bishop of Myra. And he was known for, you know, sharing his inheritance with the needy. And after his death, the legend of his gift giving grew and grew and grew. And uh, so St. Nicholas, as you may be um, noticing, he kind of transformed into Santa Claus, um, who brings presents to children all around the world on Christmas Day. Um, but what about here in Canada? Um, well, prior to um, the early European settlers coming here, um, you know, there were some First Nations who were, uh, such as the Iroquois, who were celebrating um, around the winter solstice time um, as a time for very much a regeneration and introspection. Um, and so you could have things like healing rituals, tobacco offerings, prayers, ceremonial drumming, and dancing. So there, there was sometimes uh, certain celebrations that would happen around this time. Um, but it really all, all kicked off with, um, you know, Christian early settlers very much bringing um, their uh, traditions from the old countries um, to uh, their new homes in Canada. Many of these people would have been of British, French, and American uh, origin. And so that's a lot of where our Christmas traditions are kind of coming from. Um, but of course, you know, there's all types of other um, cultures as well. Um, a really good example of this actually is uh, you see here the Christmas tree, of course. 
and um, and here is Queen Victoria and her beloved husband, Prince Albert. And Prince Albert, of course, was from uh, uh, the German region. Um, and so he brought with him the tradition of the Christmas tree. And of course, um, a lot of the, uh, the, the British subjects here in Canada, you know, they really want to celebrate in the same way that their queen was celebrating. And so they too brought with um, brought with them the, the Christmas tree uh, to Canada, um, you know, and, uh, and, and commercialization kind of, you know, it happened from here. Um, and, you know, and so that's kind of where a lot of uh, our modern Christmas traditions come from. Um, and the rest is history, as they say. Um, but what about right now? You know, over half of the Mississauga residents were actually born outside of Canada. Um, there's 200 different languages from over 150 countries. So multiculturalism has very much literally changed the fabric of how we celebrate Christmas uh, traditions. I mean, I myself know, you know, many of my um, of my family and um, and my friends who celebrate Christmas in very different ways. Um, and so, you know, this is a very welcomed uh, thing in Canada. You know, we're all celebrating together in different ways and teaching each other. Um, and so that's really what I want to do today is go over um, some of the um, the celebrations that uh, people in Mississauga celebrate um, so we can kind of understand each other um, a little bit better and uh, and share in, in the celebrating at this time of the year. So the first uh, celebration I wanted to talk about was St. Nicholas Eve. And this is celebrated in many parts of Europe, um, but I'm gonna specifically speak to the Netherlands tradition. Um, so St. Nicholas Eve is December 5th, and it is the coming of St. Nicholas or Sinterklaas, um, who brings children presents. And he appears as a bishop, as you can see here, um, so very different than our, you know, Canadian Santa Claus, right? Um, and uh, the Dutch tradition says that St. Nicholas actually lives in um, Madrid, Spain, not the North Pole. Each year, he chooses a different harbor to arrive in the Netherlands. So... Um, he's also accompanied by his uh, uh, servants known as Black Peters or City Peters. Now, unfortunately, traditionally, um, the, the Peters were shown in actual black face. And um, there's been huge controversy over this, of course. And, um, uh, and so there's been a lot of calls to change this tradition. And indeed, the tradition has changed. Um, and so there's no longer any blackface at all. Um, it is, there is sometimes soot or dirt smudges on the face, but no um, form of blackface is done any longer. Um, and, but this is a very interesting example of how, you know, traditions do change. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and people can change and they're not necessarily married uh, to, their, uh, to their traditions when, you know, it hurts people that, that they love, right? Um, and um, so the city Peters, as they're now known, the city Peters, they have a very important job because they actually keep record of the naughty and nice children. Um, this is different than, at least for growing up in Canada, how I was taught that it was, oh, it's Santa that keeps um, a list, but actually here it's actually the, the Peters. So they have a very important job as well. Um, and so children will leave, um, you know, their shoes by the fireplace or the windowsill. And, uh, you know, they are in hopes that Santa Claus will uh, leave presents in their shoe. And some will leave hay and carrots for Santa Claus's horses. Um, however, if they're bad, um, you know, they're not going to necessarily just get a piece of coal. No, no, no. Children can actually put in a sack and take it all the way back to Spain to, for a year to be taught how to behave properly. Um, so the stakes are high here. Now, um, I want to bring on a friend of mine. Um, her name is Enoch um, Limberti um, to give us a bit of a, um, a talk about what she does um, in the Netherlands. Um, she just came back from Amsterdam recently, so let's hear from her. St. Nicholas is something uh, that we celebrated at home as uh, children, uh, and what normally happens is that there's a great 
big bang in the door. Um, there's a bag left outside that's magically put there by St. Nicholas and his helpers, Black Peter. You bring the bag inside and there's you know, general, uh, wow, this is really exciting. What also should be explained is that there's a lead up to this big bang on the door. When he arrives in the Netherlands, children are allowed to put out their shoes so that you would put out your uh, shoe with, of course, something for the horse because St. Nicholas comes in on a horse. He rides a horse. And um, uh, the horse is led over the roofs magically by his helpers, again, these Black Peters. So you see the roofs, the roofs, and again, the whole symbolism of this trip across the, uh, literally, the Dutch word for uh, tiptoeing across the roof is triple, to, to, to triple all, along the roofs. And the uh, presents we put inside the shoe and the helpers will take out the straw or hay and the carrots and nice things for the horse. And uh, all of this is going on for about two weeks. And then on the actual day or the eve again of uh, St. Nicholas, that's when you get the actual giving of presents, which are always accompanied by a poem. The poem has uh, uh, a very important part the, in the whole festival. It's, it's, it's very much a family event, as you can tell because um, you need to read the poem first before you open the present, because the, the poem often talks about, you know, how you've been over the year, you know, have you been a good person? Have you been a bad person? What are the things that you really can work on if you're not on time a lot? You know, you would often get uh, a poem with a, a big clock on it to remind you of the importance of time, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, the most memorable thing, I think, was when I lived in Amsterdam, which I did for about 20 years, and um, seeing the actual uh, parade of, of, well, the, the arrival of the, of the steamboat from Spain, and I should say there's, there's lots of music that goes with this. I mean, everyone is singing. There is a song, there's my Dutch for you. And it's, uh, uh, there's a whole repertoire that the children are learning. It also helps, of course, if you don't speak the language, to learn the language. Uh, but to actually be among the children and see the reception of St. Nicholas in uh, Amsterdam uh, is really quite special. The story is that St. Nicholas, um, he comes not from the North Pole, like, Santa Claus does, but he comes from Spain. So he is actually a bishop. So, he, and he's tall, he does not have a bowl full of jelly tummy, no, no, no. And, um, but what uh, is different is that um, St. Nicholas is not a funny person. St. Nicholas is a very strict person. You know, like you, you're there to, to uh, uh, he's, he's there to make sure you've done what you're supposed to do. You know, and uh, it's the Black Peters that uh, tend to be a little bit, um, um, they're, they're the ones with a sense of humor and they try and, um, and uh, you know, make Santa Claus laugh, but that doesn't always work. Although Santa Claus has been known to tell a joke, yes. Nicholas has a big book and everything that people have done is in this book and you don't want to be in the book, you know. And um, what uh, has uh, uh, also caused great fear in the hearts of children is the bag, because the Peets have a bag that they carry around full of presents, but they also have another bag. And if you've been bad, you are put in the bag and you're taken back away to Spain. You should know that the Netherlands used to be in the 16th century also a colony of Spain. So um, the actual figure of St. Nicholas um, is an historical figure that does have roots in that part of the world, in the Mediterranean. And at the time, in the 16th century, there were a lot of um, uh, people from Africa who came up into Spain, the Moors. And Black Peter was a Moor, and he was the assistant the, the elf, that would be the, the equivalent to North America, of 
Santa Claus of, of, of uh, St. Nicholas. Now, at the time, because there weren't too many dark people in um, the Netherlands, um, blackface was used for Black Peter. And I actually grew up with this, not realizing that this is not done. Netherlands is also uh, just, is also a colonial power. And we have uh, three still uh, Caribbean islands. And, and it was indeed from these Caribbean islands and from Suriname, which is on the northern coast of South Africa, South America, uh, where, you know, the most protests came like, come on, guys, you know, this, you don't do this anymore. We've got to change. And so, indeed, I'm very pleased uh, to report that it has changed. We now no longer have Black Peters. We have what are called Soot Peters, because the Black Peter would be get would be, be become black because of going down the uh, the chimney kind of thing. So you would have streaks of black, but black face is no longer done. Once St. Nicholas is celebrated and it's all over on December the 6th, then we get into the whole Christmas thing. And Christmas is, of course, the celebration of the birth of Christ. And we have what we call first Christmas day and second Christmas day. And first Christmas Day is very much a, uh, a family event. It, you know, the, the turkey thing is not done. I mean, uh, what you might have is, is, you know, just a nice sit down dinner. And for second Christmas Day, which is Boxing Day here, uh, everything is also closed. And that's the day that people go out and visit family. I would like to thank Enoch as well as the Netherlands Luncheon Club for their great insight with all of this. Thank you so much for being part of this. Um, and our next um, celebration is uh, we go to Austria and Germany for Krampus. I don't know if, if uh, you have heard of this, um, but Krampus is this Christmas monster who accompanies St. Nicholas. And the word Krampen actually means claw in German. Um, and uh, this creature and St. Nicholas are said to arrive on the evening of December 5th, known as Krampus Night. Um, and Krampus is uh, uh, not not a particularly a nice uh, uh, guy now. Um, he's known to beat children, eat them, and even drag them back to hell. Um, so yeah, a bit scary. Um, and, uh, you know, this picture you would think is taken in Halloween, but no, this is Krampus Night, um, which is a parade featuring Krampus, um, well, people dressed as Krampus, I should say, running around, scaring and chasing people um, about, and he is depicted as this half goat, half demon. And the chains around him symbolize the chaining of the devil by the Christian church. Now, this uh, Krampus run was revived in um, the 20th century to very much preserve um, Austrian and German culture. Um, and now it, of course, is a, a beloved tradition. Um, uh, and going on the goat theme, we have the Yule Bok from Sweden. Um, and the Yule Bok, meaning Yule goat, um, comes once again from these ancient uh, pagan beliefs. Um, now, we all know the Nordic god um, Thor, correct? You know, with the hammer and everything. Now, his chariot, if you know, is actually pulled by two goats known as Gap Tooth and Tooth Grinder. Yeah, but you didn't know that. Um, and they are known to provide food to everyone um, because every night they are slaughtered and the next morning they rise again um, to, to feed more people, basically. Um, and there are all these midwinter celebrations, including the Yule Offer, which was a reenactment of the Yule Bok sacrifice. However, with the rise of Christianity, the Yule Bok was seen in not a very favorable light. Um, you know, he's very much seen as, as a demon almost. However, in the 16th century, something shifts. There's a renewal of these older beliefs, um, and uh, the Yule Bok, Bok is back in the good books, if you will, um, as a good name natured gift giver. Um, and, um, and I should say that it was also, uh, the Yule Bok was incorporated into a lot of these Christmas traditions. So for example, um, Santa Claus, 
who does he deliver the presence with? Um, you know, is it Rudolph and the reindeers? No, it's actually the Yule goat um, that pulls his sleigh. Um, so in 1966, um, the, the city of Yavel, Sweden, they decide that they want to do something fun for the Christmas season. So they just said, hey, let's make a giant straw statue of the goat each Christmas season. Um, and now this thing is, is huge, okay? Um, you can see it there. It is um, made it into the Guinness World Record book for its size. So it's known all around the world, okay? It, it's this big thing. Um, however, this has started a new tradition as well, um, which is the burning of the goat, uh, hilariously, um, uh, or maybe not so much uh, for the goat itself. Um, but people will try to burn this goat down. And out of around 50 um, times that they have done the goat, 35 of them have been destroyed. In 2016, uh, they had the 50th anniversary of, uh, of the first Yule goat statue. Well, when you know it, that night, it was burned down the same night it was unveiled, mind you. Um, so, so it did not last long. And over the years, there have been some, shall I say, interesting attempts um, to burn it down. In 2001, an American tourist uh, burned it down, thinking that it was an acceptable version of, um, you know, the Swedish Christmas traditions. Um, he wasn't believed and he spent two weeks in jail. Um, and in 2005, get this, there was a group that dressed up as Santa and gingerbread men and began firing flaming arrows at the goat. Yes, it did burn down that year. And in 2010, a security guard actually thwarted a plot to use a helicopter to fly away with the goat. Um, so bravo to the security guards, I will say, um, uh, for keeping it safe um, uh, the rest of, of the time. Um, and uh, next, we jump over to another country, um, if not another continent, to Colombia. Um, and uh, to the Day of Little Candles. And this is the beginning of the Colombian Christmas season. Um, and it's December 7th, and it's this visual um, for the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. So people will gather with lights and uh, candles, and they'll um, put these in homes, parks, malls, all over the place, really. Um, and it's really a time to reflect, give thanks, and even some people will make, you know, Christmas wishes. Um, however, the most important thing about it is that it's a time to spend with family, friends, and also to eat some pretty good food. Um, and after this, uh, after the Christmas celebration starts, you have this Novena de Aguinaldos, um, which is a nine-day, Novena meaning ninth, um, nine-day re uh, religious ceremony to actually honor the baby Jesus. And uh, the prayers were written and published in 1743 by Fray Fernando de Rea Jesus, and uh, he was a preacher in Ecuador and Colombia. Okay, so he's a historic figure. Now, um, his uh, novena prayers, they included prayers to the Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, and of course, the little baby Jesus. And you can recite them together or separately. And now each night after the prayers, the family, friends, they'll all come together and they'll eat, they'll sing, they'll have musical instruments. Um, and so it's just really like a great party together. Um, and what of El Nino Jesus or the baby Jesus? Well, he actually blesses them with being able to have presents. So, you know, in Canada, we think of Santa Claus brings presents, but actually no, here it is the baby Jesus. So that's a bit different as well. And then I'll have my friend, um, Isabel uh, Correra. He, she will uh, tell us a bit about the Colombian Christmas traditions. Official Christmas event start on December 7th. December 7th, why? Because on December 7th, we celebrate the candles, the light, the many candles, yeah? That means that we put at the door of the houses, we put the candles, 
you see, and in our houses in, in the street. And that means is the illuminate the way, yeah, for the Virgin Mary came to the houses and blessing and bless them. The Christmas celebration, uh, we have also the Novena de Aguinaldos. Novena de Aguinaldos is, uh, is the traditional, is the tradition from, especially from, uh, for Catholic uh, people, families. We visit the other friends. Each family have their own Novena de Aguinaldos. And we visit different houses uh, and, and you imagine we are nine, we are we are eleven, yeah. And we say, okay, uh, on December, for example, now in my in Colombia, they are organized the schedule. You see, where is the first day? Where is the second day? The third day? The fourth day? And I remember the, in that town, that my mother they made the novena, novena de aguinaldos. And she invited all children because this is special for children. Is to pray Jesus, to pray uh, the Virgin Maria, and to say thank you and, and for everything. Um, and I remember with my mother, the when she organized the novena, she invited the children for the whole the neighbors, and was around. I remember was around 25, 30, 30 children, 30 kids. And it's, it's a, what's amazing is that it's very good because all them, they sing singing the, the Christmas uh, chores, they sing that and we sing that, yeah. Uh, at the end, I remember that my mother say, if you come every day, every night, at the end, I have a gift for you. And of course, the old, <laughs> the old kids come in every day, every day. And the last night, um, my mother uh, gave to them, gave candies, um, and was the special dish, special uh, everything. Uh, but was 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 amazing, really. In the series are in the coast, the weather is hot. They have the this tradition. They close the streets. They close the streets. You imagine, and they put the big big speaker. They put music and dancing until 5 and 6 a.m. all night. <laughs> and they share the food, they share the, and sometimes I remember in, in my town, I remember that they close and they bring the group, the orchestras, for example, the bands, and oh my God, it's so fun. This is bring the, the gift for children, you see. But it, in Colombia, for example, in, in my house, uh, we open the gift on 24 night, at the, at the midnight. I remember when I was a child, they, oh my God, we were in, were in, were in until 12 o'clock night, uh, the 24, to open my gift, you see? And that tradition is continue with us. For example, in my family, we continue with that tradition. And I know the Colombian families in here in Canada, they continue with that tradition. In, in Mississauga, we continue with that. Uh, when I came to Canada uh, 17, also 17, 17 years ago, I started to celebrate the, the Novena de Aguinaldos in Community Center, in Mississauga Valley Community Center. Uh, we organized that for almost two, three years. And many children go and we celebrate the Christmas like our country. Christmas is, is to be happy. That is Christmas. Thank you again for having me and this beautiful project. Uh, on behalf of the Colombian community in Mississauga, I would like to say thank you. Thank you so much, Heritage Mississauga, for inviting us to be part of the, this beautiful project. Happy holidays for everyone. A big shout out and a thanks to Isabel for that. She is absolutely a rock star and to the Mississauga Land Festival as well. They're great. Um, and so for our next celebration, we go to Mexico for Las Posadas. Um, and so this is a nine night religious celebration spanning from December 16th to the 24th. And Las Posadas, of course, in Spanish is means in the inns. 
Um, and it's basically meant to commemorate the journey that Joseph and Mary took to find refuge to give birth to the baby Jesus, which is, um, this is the story in the Bible. Um, so the children, they will often dress up for the procession. So you'll find someone who's an angel and maybe a Joseph and a Mary, um, and they'll have a procession through the streets of the town. Um, and the procession will stop at a home and ask for lodging for Joseph and Mary, um, just like in the story. And the procession is always refused lodging. This is, this is to, to keep the storyline, if you will. Um, and um, although I'm told that they uh, will also, uh, you know, give them some food and stuff like this at the door. Um, but uh, they will recite scripture um, from the Bible and uh, they'll sing Christmas carols. So it's this really fun time. And uh, afterwards, mass is held um, after the procession and um, the children will get together and they'll break open the star-shaped pinata um, that's filled with candy and toys and money. So you can imagine for children, this is a much beloved holiday, if you will. Um, and so I'd like to bring on another one of my friends to chat more about the uh, the Mexican um, Christmas tradition. So I'd like to introduce Chef Viridico and Jorge Ortega um, and uh, to talk about some Mexican traditions. I am Viri, Viri Rico. I am from Mexico and I am from Borja MX Mexican Grill right here in Stretchville. So back home is such a big uh, celebration. So we are from a hot country. We're from Mexico. So we love celebrating. So we basically celebrate around, I could say, 10 to 12 days before Christmas Day. So we have like a posada style, some Mexican party we do to um, get together with friends and to basically have some food. And the most important thing about it is that breaking the piñata. When we do it and we have friends coming over, they are like, oh, what is going on, right? So they don't really know exactly. They think it's just hitting a piñata and that's it, right? They don't really know the tradition that is behind, like making a wish, making all the bad stuff living, and uh, yeah, just keeping and getting that reward when the, when the piñata is breaking. In terms of the, the posadas, you know what? That's more in terms of um, more religious stuff. So you basically sing that uh, song, some people even start praying. But yeah, you go from house to house. Some people sing inside of the house, some other outside of the house. We all start singing and getting together. Everybody has like a um, candle in their hands. We walk and it all depends how big it is. If it's just a family posada, it's just something small. You start out, outside of the house, inside, that's it. But let's say if it's a community posada, so you can even visit different places before getting to the destination. Most important thing that I always remember, it is sharing with family. Christmas Day, same thing, we do that posada, and it's basically having some time with family. Back home where there's a big, um, big families, you know, like 10, 20, 30 people sometimes. And we do like that exchange of uh, presents. So it is very funny. Imagine having 30 people at home exchanging gifts all over the place, gifts flying. So that's, that's something like very memorable that we make time. First of the food we actually eat uh, back home for a posada, it is very uh, traditional style. We do a very popular drink. It's uh, like a fruit punch, but it is fresh made. It is made every single day for a posada. It's basically a bunch of fruits, some uh, sugar cane. It's got some, um, uh, what else? It's got some guavas, um, cinnamon, cameron. And a bunch of stuff is very, very um, yeah, it's very, very good. And some people, like for adult style, do add a little bit of tequila, rum, why not? You cannot miss it, of course. <laughs> um, in terms of food, um, yeah, like tacos are very popular. So as I said, like it's more like community style. 
So everybody brings outside like a potluck, I would say. So everybody brings outside a dish. And we do have something like a hard shell taco, the traditional style, like we serve it at Puerto Max, it's called tostada. So they're round crunchy tacos and you put stuff right on top. That's very popular for a posada. What else, pozole soup. You can find a pozole is uh, like a um, corn soup with a bunch of vegetables inside and it's it's a pork or chicken, it's, it's good too, it's very yummy. And uh, the very traditional stuff, just just like we serve it at Border MX, traditional authentic Mexican food. A huge thank you to Border MX for that. Their food is really great. Check them out in Streetsville. Um, and thank you so much for being part of this project, of course. Um, so, you know, we've talked about a lot of these traditions and, um, and you know, like as time goes on, our traditions are changing and, and that's a good thing, right? Um, you know, because we're, uh, well, at my house, when everyone gets together, we kind of joke that it's like United Nations, right? There's so many different people celebrating so many different things and it's great um, to, to, you know, celebrate each other. Um, so, you know, I wanna ask you um, these things and comment down below, by the way, um, you know, what Christmas Trudeau celebrations are you celebrating this, this year? Um, and, um, you know, and will you be incorporating anything new maybe into your, uh, into your Christmas celebrations? Um, and then this is one thing I was kind of, I, I was thinking to myself the other day is, you know, maybe in a hundred years, what are our uh, Christmas celebrations going to look like? You know, is it going to be the same? Is it going to be different? Things are always changing, evolving. Um, and so, you know, it's very interesting to kind of think about these hypotheticals, right? Okay, so I would love if you guys would tune in next week. We just really scratched the surface of all the different um, cultures and traditions um, around the world. And so, we are going to talk about way more next week, so make sure you tune in and you're going to meet a lot more of, of my friends talking about their own uh, Christmas traditions as well. So all really great stuff, um, and so hope to see you next week. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. We had a great time. Um, and uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. Happy holidays to everyone. And a very happy New Year's. Thank you so much on behalf of Heritage Mississauga. Goodbye. <laughs>